Hey there, I want to speak a little more to things like discipleship and sanctification and walking in the Spirit because it's one of those things you just have to keep speaking to until it penetrates. And some people are, I feel like they're on the verge of like something, a light bulb or something going off. Um, okay, so we also say discipleship a lot, okay? Now, discipleship, I've said it's presented differently in the synoptic gospels and in first john and in john and the reason for that is that john is presenting jesus in the light of the mystery of christ it's all pointing that god wants to dwell in you in christ and wants you to dwell in him that's called the mystery of christ paul revealed that christ in you the hope of glory John's gospel is built on Pauline truth. It's a gospel for the church. It's a gospel for regenerated people who are believing in Jesus already when they read it. It deals with spiritual truths that the natural man cannot receive. It deals with spiritual things that only a regenerated believer could understand. Only a regenerated believer can benefit from abide in me and I in you. Okay? Because that reality was not established until the resurrection of Christ. So that's why John 15 follows John 14. And John 14 is not a rapture passage, it's a resurrection passage. In my father's house there's many abodes. I go to prepare a place for you. Um, if it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go, I will come and receive you to myself, that where I am, present tense, you may also be. And they ask, well, what? We don't know where you're going, you know, where are you? <laughs> he said, I am in my father and my father is in me. That's his present reality of dwelling in the father and the father in him. And then if you go to the end of chapter 14, he says in that day, he talks, he's talking about his resurrection. I'm going to go away, but I'm going to come back and you'll see me in a way the world will not see me, but you'll see me. And they'll say, say, well, how, how is it the world won't see you? But we will see you. Well, that's because I'm sending you the spirit, spirit, the comforter, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. But you know him because he's with you and will be in you. And then he says, in that day, the day when he comes to you to receive you to himself, you, he says, you will know that I am in my father, my father's in me, and I in you and you in me. In other words, this journey he's making to go to the Father and then come back and receive us to himself is going to produce a union in which, just as he dwells in the Father and the Father in him, he will dwell in us and we in him. And that was established at the resurrection of Christ. Again, in that day refers to the day of his resurrection. His going and his coming was his going to the Father through death and resurrection. And now he's come back to receive us to himself that where he is, we may also be. Where was he? He was in the Father. Now, just as he is in the Father and the Father is in him, for every regenerated believer, we know that he dwells in us and we in him because he's come to us in a way the world cannot receive him. How? As the Spirit. Uh, the Spirit is... Christ to us. He doesn't speak of himself. He takes from what Christ is and has accomplished and reveals it and manifests it to us. He glorifies Christ in us. He is the spirit of Jesus Christ. Just like John 7, 39, 37, 39 said, um, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Uh, as the scriptures said, he that believes on me out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of the spirit who was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. The rivers of living water is a new phenomena. It proceeds out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And the throne of God and of the Lamb speaks of the divine throne with the man, Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God, who has sat down at the right hand of God after he made purification of our sins. Now that throne is the throne of God and of the Lamb. And now, out of that throne proceeds a river of water of life, clear as crystal. 
And that is the river that has reached us and regenerated us, and it is the Spirit. It is the eternal life. And by that Spirit, we now dwell in, the, in Christ and He in us, just as He dwells in the Father, and the Father dwells in the Son. Now, that is all the setup for John 15, which is abide in me and I in you. Now, the word abide there is the same word for abode in uh, John 14. In my Father's house, there are many abodes. Same word. Abide in me and I in you. You can't abide in him and he in you until you are a believer who has received the Spirit, which is all post-resurrection realities. So everything John's going to speak of, and we'll get to it when we get in our John, but from 14 through 17 is only stuff that a regenerated New Testament believer after the resurrection of Christ who is indwelt by the Spirit can understand. So that's why I say that's not really a rapture verse. We, I mean, I'm a pre-trib rapture person, and I appreciate the beauty of some of the symbolism, but really that's not a rapture verse. That's a resurrection verse. And it's talking about the establishing of God's house. We are God's household. We are being built together to be a habitation of God in spirit. The New Jerusalem is not a physical city we are going to. It is a person we are becoming. It's the Lamb's wife. But anyway, that's too big for here. Uh, and it was John that revealed the new city of Jerusalem, by the way. There, some of this is his uniquely to reveal. Um... Okay, so discipleship in John is put in this context. We already saw a, f a couple chapters ago in John, if you continue in my word, you will be my disciples indeed, and the truth will set you, f uh, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And he put that in the context of saying that the Pharisees were slaves. They were slaves of sin. And the slave, we know from Galatians, does not stay in the house forever, but is cast out. So the spirit of bondage of slavery, which really came from the law, uh, has no place in the father's house. Okay, so discipleship is a matter of continuing in the word to be set free from the slavery. And I was talking about in that one that that really corresponds with Romans 8, which tells us that we no longer... Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God, for we have not received a spirit of slavery, bringing us into fear, but a spirit of sonship, in which we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself witnesses with our spirit that we are children of God. Romans 8 is talking about how, how the leading of the Spirit of God disciples us out of the house of slavery, bondage, and fear, and into the spirit of sonship, which is the source of our confidence. It's the witness of the Spirit. And the way he does it, according to Romans 8, is by the renewing of the mind. The mindset on the things of the Spirit is life and peace. Well, the renewing of the mind happens by the washing of the water of the Word. If you continue in my Word, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And that freedom is the freedom out of the house of slavery to the law and slavery to sin and into the freedom of the sons of God. It all harmonizes. Um, and I know I'm speaking really emphatically, but I'm trying to, I'm focusing very intensely on what I'm trying to say. So if it sounds, whatever, this is just, <laughs> sorry, you know. Uh, okay, so John 15 then uses the word disciples as well. And he says, now you're already clean because of the word which I spoke to you. So a disciple in resurrection is someone who's already clean. You've already been sanctified. You've already been justified. You've already been washed in the name of Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. But what do you have need of? You need to continue in the word. And he said, if you continue in the word, you are my disciples. Continue in the word. And he says, abide in me and I in you. Now, uh, 1 John tells us what that means. 1 John, by the way, is the doctrinal answers to the book of John. 1 jo John tells us about Jesus, and John, 1 John further explains his teachings. 1 John explains the message that we heard from him, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. 
Okay, so if you want to know about really understanding what he's talking about in John, you need to understand 1 John 2. I mean, as well. And 1 John tells us, uh, Now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears you may have confidence that is coming and not shrink back in shame or fear. In other words, you want to be brought out of bondage of fear and into confidence. And this is done by abiding. And John 2, 1 John 2 also tells us what it means to abide. If that which you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Father and in the Son. And this is the message, this is the promise he made to us, even eternal life. It is a message. If that which you heard from the beginning, the gospel that tells you who Jesus Christ is and what he accomplished, that is the word that was made flesh that is the seed of god the incorruptible seed that is the seed that abides in us if we believe that jesus is the christ son of the living god by believing on his person and his work we are regenerated we are made the children of god we have received the spirit we've been brought into god and god has been brought into us and by continuing in that message and holding on to it and not letting go of it, treasuring it, we will become free by pursuing that truth and holding fast to it and abiding in it. We will have confidence it is coming and not shrink back in shame. We will become increasingly confident because if you are my disciples, you'll continue in my, you'll, uh, you'll continue in my word and you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And it's not just any random words. It's the words of the risen, ascended Christ who says, abide in me and I in you. That is not something that you could do unless you were regenerated. And the way we abide in him is to continue in his word, which means to continue in the truth of who he is. And 1 John 5 says, you know, if we receive the uh, testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, and this is the testimony which he has testified concerning his Son. And whoever has this testimony, or whoever believes this testimony, has the testimony in himself because it is the Spirit that testifies. So you can know that you're born again. You can have assurance that you have eternal life because God's record concerning his Son dwells in you as his seed. And that is the living Word of God. And that is the message we heard from the beginning. And if it abides in us, and we abide in it, we will continue in the Father and in the Son, meaning that he will be, we will be more and more at home in him, and not in uh, the spirit of bondage and fear. Uh, i got to get the doorbell. I'll have to append this. So I'm trying to hold all this together. Okay, so this is discipleship in John. Discipleship has to do with continuing in the word of Christ, which is the record of God concerning his son, which is the gospel, which is the person and work of Christ by faith. It's just pursuing that word and not deviating from it because it's your crown. It's your confidence. It's what the spirit bears witness to. It's what washes you and renews your mind. You're already clean because of the word I spoke to you. Now you need to abide in me and continue in my word. Now, discipleship is not spoken of in any of the epistles. We overuse the term because it's not a word that's used a lot after the resurrection of Christ, except in the book of John, and it's got a very different flavor than in the Synoptic Gospels. In the Synoptic Gospels, discipleship is a hardship. It comes to you as an adversary. Uh, and I did a message on that. Discipleship is coming to you as an adversary pursue terms of peace. When Jesus was talking about discipleship in Luke, for example, he said, look, unless you forsake all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. And as an example, he says, look, if a king uh, has an army of 10,000 and there's another army, another king coming at him with an army of 20,000, he knows he's going to def be defeated. So what does he do? He waves the white flag of surrender and seeks terms of peace. In other words discipleship is coming at you 
and it's more than you have the resources to uh, bring, you bring to the table. It is a conquering army, and it's coming at you as an adversary. You need to pursue terms of peace. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, discipleship is presented as a burden. And it is discouraged, if you can believe that, in the, especially in the book of Luke. If you get the idea that he's trying to convince people that they can't be his disciple, you're on the right track. Every time he talks about discipleship, he's telling you, your strength ain't going to do it. You're, you don't have enough troops. You can't make it. Unless you hate your father and your mother uh, and deny yourself and take up your cross, you're not worthy of me and you can't be my disciple. And finally, as he kept bringing his disciples into the reality of what discipleship was, he told them, look, where I'm going, you can't follow. They're like, oh, we're going to follow you. He goes, no, you can't follow me where I'm going. And they literally couldn't. They couldn't even stand with him in the hour of Gethsemane. They, the spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. They couldn't go to the cross. They, could not, he did, they did not have the authority to give their own life the way he did. Jesus is the only one who actually cut the path. Okay, He went to the cross alone. He laid his life down and no one takes it from him because he had the authority to do that. He was in charge and nobody could follow him there. It's the same thing he was saying in John 14. Where I go, you cannot follow. So what's the deal? Well, I'm going to go. You're going to be sorrowful. I'm going to go to my and, pre and I'm preparing a place for you. So that, and then I'm going to come and receive you to myself that where I am, you may also be. And in that day, you'll know that just as I am in the Father and the Father in me, you are in me and I in you. I'm going to produce the vine. I'm going to produce the body of Christ. I'm going to produce the habitation of God. I'm going to produce the new man in my death and resurrection. We know that the death of Christ was a redemptive act, but it was also a creative act. Unless a, 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 unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus had to die and give his life to make us part of himself. We are only his disciples after resurrection. Before that, the cross had not been accomplished. People had, those disciples had not been reconciled to God. They had not been transferred out of the authority of darkness. They had not been transferred into the kingdom of the Son. They had not obtained redemption and the forgiveness of sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. They had not been buried with him in baptism into his death and risen to walk in newness of life. They had not been brought out of the house of slavery and into the liberty of the sons of God. They had not been made heirs of God. They had not received the promise of the Father, the Spirit. Okay? So... When you talk about discipleship in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you're talking about something that's just not possible for man. And he even says that, you know, with man, it is impossible. With God, all things are possible. The ultimate realization is Jesus has to go alone into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle his blood. And then when he did that, he made his own flesh a new and living way to bring us into the presence within the veil. Until he made a way for us in his flesh, there was no way for us. Nobody comes to the Father but by him. So, so many talk about discipleship, but I'm not sure they know what that means. It's another term like sanctification or progressive sanctification that is thrown around and not rightly divided, overused and loaded with religious concepts that speak of labor speak of burden, and speak of an intolerable situation that we can't even really endure. It's, a, it's like a yoke uh, of the law, you know. We are not taking up our cross the way Jesus talked about it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We have been crucified with Christ. Our death has already been accomplished. Everything has already been accomplished. 
Christ has made himself a new and living way, and he has come and manifested himself to us through regeneration when we believed on him. We were regenerated of the seed. We, his testimony now abides in us. His spirit is in us, and we know him in a way that the world cannot know him. And we are now in him, and he is in us, just as he is in the Father, and the Father is in him. We are the many abodes. And now, because that reality has been established, we can abide in him and he in us. And that is to be his disciples, which in, in the John uh, perspective is a matter of being clean because his word cleansed you. And then abiding in his word and continuing in the knowledge of him and growing in in the knowledge of what he accomplished for you so that it delivers you out of the slavery and brings you into the spirit of sonship and renews your mind and makes you at home in the father's house more than you're at home in the flesh more than you're home in condemnation more than you're at home in the devil's accusations no you're now growing through the knowledge of the gospel and the truth you're growing to be at home in the spirit of sonship where the spirit witnesses with your spirit that you are a child of God and if so an heir you know all things are working for your good you know that you are loved by the father in the same way that he loved the son and that the love of the father for the son abides in you and you're dwelling in the love of God and his perfect love is casting out all fear it's driving out the spirit of fear and slavery how by your continuing in the gospel and growing in the knowledge of what it is that Christ has accomplished. If you think that the gospel is just, Jesus forgave my sins and now I get to go to heaven, no wonder you don't understand why I talk about the gospel so much. Because that is a very limited and superficial view. No, Christ accomplished so much for us. And it's all past tense. And now it is an inheritance for us to enjoy and explore that's already ours in the spirit. And the difference between someone who grows and does not grow is whether or not they are growing to appreciate this body of truth, which is called his word. That's it. It is simply a matter of beholding what Christ is and what he's accomplished by faith. And the faith becomes a vision that encompasses everything that is ours now in Christ. And we are growing in it and growing in it and growing in it and growing in it. And as we do, it's setting us free. That's discipleship. Discipleship liberates you. It doesn't put bondage on you. If you're thinking of discipleship in a way that puts bondage on you, then you are not in resurrection. You're thinking back before Jesus went to the cross. The discipleship in John is a post-resurrection discipleship for the church. And then in the epistles, you don't see the word discipleship at all. Okay, so there's a, I think there's a reason why the word is de-emphasized because it's loaded with religious bondage, not bondage, baggage, um, having to do with the earthly Jesus. And Paul said, we're no longer to know Jesus know each other after the flesh. We used to know Christ after the flesh, but now no more. We know him as the seed of David who has become the son of God, according to the spirit of holiness and by the resurrection of the dead, with power, ascended to the throne of God, sat down at the right hand of God, which is now the throne of God and of the Lamb. And now there's a river flowing out. And we're learning to drink of that river freely by grace, through faith, Okay, uh, I need to append these two together and I'll upload and talk to you guys later.